Thank you. Okay. So I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak here, but I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for actually being here after last night. And I'm not assuming uh, that this is just due to the airport uh, bus shuttles uh, being or leaving at one o'clock early. Anyway, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, route responses to differential water availability in soil. And the um, reason why this is an important question is sort of like shown in this map here. So, um, Currently, we're using around about 70% of all fresh water available on the planet for agriculture, mostly of that for irrigation. And in the regions highlighted in orange, uh, water is already um, limiting for agriculture or is very uh, rapidly becoming limiting for agriculture. And as you can see, Israel is right bang in the middle of this orange region. But it's not only there where water is getting limiting, um, because currently, even the UK is experiencing uh, a drought, so it hasn't been raining for six weeks, and farmers are getting really worried about their harvests and what they're going to feed their livestock and how they're going to water them. So we really need to uh, address these questions of how plants are getting to their water and understanding how and being able to manipulate how plant roots are... Um, responding to differential water availability in soils is hopefully um, going to help answering this uh, question. So one of the things we really need to keep in the back of our minds when addressing this question is that soil is a very complex environment for plants to forage, for water resources, and also for nutrients. And what this um, micro CT uh, scan of a field core shows um, is not only soil particles and uh, the air spaces, and in blue the water is shown, and what you hopefully have already seen there, um, that uh, although this is a field core which has been scanned at field capacity, so with the maximum amount of water it will be able to contain, um, that there are regions in there um, where water is already um, not um, available. So if this is happening already in uh, soil which is at maximum capacity, you can only imagine what's going to happen if this core is going to dry down. You're actually, the, the water um, is going to be distributed a lot more unevenly uh, and more difficult to access for the plants. And but as Bob already briefly mentioned, roots are really plastic in response uh, to water availability. And this is just demonstrated uh, in this rather sort of like very simplistic uh, rhizotron experiment where I planted May seedlings that were all at the same stage when I put them in there. Um, and what differs between the rhizotrons is where the water is available. So here we have a lateral water gradient where there's more weight, water available here. Um, and in the rhizotron here on the right, we have a sort of like the more, what you would expect to find in the soil, uh, gradient where there's less water at the top and more water available at the bottom. And you can see how this already shapes very much the root angle uh, at which those maize roots are growing. So in my talk, I'm going to um, present data on three responses that roots are showing if there's uh, a heterogeneity in the water available in, in their growth medium. So I'm going to talk about hydrotropism, zero branching, and hydropatterning. And for those of you who haven't been to the hydrotropism session, which uh, was on Monday, um, this is what hydrotropism looks like. So these are Arabidopsis seedlings, and normally those roots would be growing down straight following the uh, gravity vector, but in the region highlighted here in sort of like this reddish color, um, I've added sorbitol, which lowers the water potential, 
and the roots are able to perceive that and change the growth direction and avoid this area where it's much more difficult for, for them to take up water. And knowledge of this phenomenon of hydrotropism had been around for quite a long time. So there's already sort of like, yeah, in the sort of like, I think the earliest mention of hydrotropism is sometimes in the 1600s. Um, but unlike its close cousin gravitropism, we know a lot less um, about how it works. So for, for gravitropism, we know that the perception is in calomela, and you get then this lateral auxin gradient, and you get this increased transport of auxin through the lateral root cap and the epidermis towards the elongation zone, which um, shapes the root's growing response so that the root's bending down. Now, for hydrotropism, until very recently, we knew a lot less about that. So there was some data that uh, perception in the columella or in the lateral root cap might be taking place. Um, it was known that ABA is involved in the response, but not exactly how, and very little was known about the actual bending mechanism. And um, in a paper we published last year, we sort of like started to address this question. So we had a look at, um, first of all, uh, which part of the root is uh, required for perception of hydrotropism. And we did that using um, laser ablation. And you can see here on the right is the root uh, where uh, the columella cells have been ablated. And this is um, yeah, this is shown by them being able to take up a propidiomyodite stain. So this region here, uh, the cells are dead. And if you're looking at the gravitropic curvature of those roots, uh, the laser ablated roots um, um, in red, they are show that they're unable to gravitropically bend, whereas uh, so the not ablated are nicely bending here. But if you're looking at the hydrotropism response, um, there is actually no difference between uh, the roots where the, uh, the columella has been ablated and the unablated roots. So columella um, in these experiments doesn't appear to be necessary for hydrotropism perception and response. And uh, you can uh, go even further with your laser ablation. So you can remove a bigger portion of the root cap and you can get rid of even the whole meristem and those roots are still hydrotropically bending. Um, and just as a sort of like backup experiment, I also just took a um, scalpel blade to roots and cut off the meristem region and these roots were also um, responding hydrotropically. So that we think um, Hydrotropism can be perceived by the elongation zone and can drive the root bending response. So that was perception. Um, we also uh, wanted to have a little closer look at the ABA response and how that is involved in hydrotropism. So just as a, a brief reminder, uh, the core signal transaction pathway are for ABA. Um, consists of those uh, per pill receptors which bind ABA and then recruit PP2C phosphatases and inhibit their action. And that this then in turn allows SNRK2 kinases to become active phosphorylated and phosphorylate in turn downstream um, uh, factors of the signal transaction pathway. And there are three of these SNRK kinases have been shown to be involved in ABA signaling. And if you knock out two of them, so SNRK22 two, two and 2.3, um, you're getting a quite big reduction in the hydrotropism response. So in the wild type, you get an about 35 degree bending here in this assay at 12 hours, uh, whereas in the double mutant, you only get about sort of like 10 degrees of a bend. So that's a quite significant reduction and shows that these kinases are involved in, in hydrotropism. And you can actually restore the response by um, expressing SNRK22 in the double mutant background. So then you're um, nicely restoring the hydrotropism response. 
So we wanted to use these mutants to explore where in the root tip um, ABA signaling is important for hydrotropism. And so in the first instance, we had to look where is this kinase expressed. So um, we did a GFP fusion, and then if you're looking at uh, your root, you can see it's everywhere. So all the different tissues, uh, tissue layers from the root tip right up into the elongation zone, they're expressing SNRK22. So that's not very informative. So it could be any of those tissues contributing to hydrotropism. So we used a um, tissue-specific complementation approach where um, we put SNRK22 back into the double mutant background under the control of different tissue-specific promoters. So this is now just an endpoint measurement. We're looking at hydrotropic curvature at 12 hours uh, after the start of the assay. In Colombia, you're sort of like here, about 35 degree bending. Um, in the double mutant, you get a much lower response. And then um, these are the lines where SNRK22 has been put back under a lateral root cap specific promoter, an epidermis specific promoter, cortex and endodermis. And you can see that most of them can't rescue the hydrotropism response. But that is enough if you express SNRK22 in the cortex to rescue the hydrotropism response. So SNRK22 signaling in the cortex is really required for hydrotropism. And we also wanted to have a look at how ABA actually uh, can influence root growth. So. Um, a lot of the, the older studies uh, looking at how ABA affects root growth um, use uh, really rather huge concentration of ABA in their experiments. But if you're just adding 100 nanomolar of ABA, um, you can actually see uh, an increase in root growth. Um, and again, this is SNRK2 dependent. And if you then look where actually this change in root growth is achieved, it's not happening in the meristem, so the length of the meristem stays the same. Um, and actually, I also checked the meristem cell number. That is also the same. Um, but the length of the elongation zone increases if you treat roots with 100 nanomolar ABA. Um, and the length of mature cells increases. And again, this is happening in a cortex-specific fashion because it is enough... Um, if I'm expressing SNRK22 in the cortex, so this is also the line that is able to restore the hydrotropism response, um, if I'm treating those lines with 100 nanomolar of ABA, I'm also seeing the same increase in root growth and the same increase in elongation zone length when I treat them with ABA. So that's, this led us to the idea that maybe it is sort of like differential elongation in the cortex that is driving the hydrotropism response. And so we wanted to mesh, uh, mess around with um, differential elongation in a tissue-specific manner. And how did we do this? So we were using uh, a gulf four driven system um, where we can, uh, again, tissue-specifically express um, a cell cycle gene called Siamese. Um, I'm not going to go here into the details of uh, the actual mechanism of what Siamese does, um, but what you can quite nicely see in those images that depending on the tissue where you're expressing it, so in the epidermis, the cortex, or the endodermis, um, and these different tissues are also expressing a nuclear localized um, GFP, you see that the length of these cells um, already prematurely increases right in the meristem, but only in those tissues where you're overexpressing expressing So the other tissue layers are unaffected by this. And what we we're hoping for was that if we already have this massive increase in cell length in the meristem, that the rather small differential elongation you need uh, for hydrotropism is negated. And the results from these lines are actually quite nice. So um, just focusing on those colored bars here. So if we're um, 
messing up uh, differential cell elongation in the epidermis and in the endodermis, uh, the hydrotropism response is not affected. But again, if we're doing this in the cortex, um, the uh, roots become ahydrotropic. So in summary for hydrotropism, um, in the, the experiments that we have done, uh, we couldn't see that the columella or uh, the meristem actually contribute anything uh, to perception um, of the hydrotropism response and that the elongation zone um, is, seems to be rather critical for this. Uh, we've also shown that um, the cortex layer of the root is very important for the hydrotropism response and you need ABA signaling in this particular tissue uh, layer to um, drive the response. And from our further experiments, we think that it's really the differential elongation of the cortex cells uh, that drives hydrotropism. Okay, so uh, the next um, root response I'm going to talk about is zero branching. So you may have, if you went to uh, Xavier Dreyer's talk, you may have already seen some of these images. So zero branching is happening uh, when the root loses uh, sort of like contact totally with water. So we're having here again um, CT images um, of maize and barley roots growing through a top layer of soil which is separated from the bottom layer by about a two centimeter um, air gap. And what you hopefully can quite nicely see is that the lateral roots um, which are developing here in, the, in this uh, topsoil, um, they are not uh, happening in the, as soon as the roots are growing into this air gap. So um, lateral root uh, formation is inhibited uh, while the, the root is growing through this air gap. And to, um, to just to show that this is just not due to losing contact with the soil medium, if you're filling up uh, this gap with water, um, you're getting uh, quite prolific uh, formation of lateral roots. So this seems to be really a water-driven uh, response, this inhibition of uh, lateral root formation. And to get down to uh, the mechanism involved in this response, we first had a look at what stage lateral root formation um, is inhibited. So uh, we did um, vibratome sections of the roots from the topsoil bit, from the bit that's growing through the air gap and through the bottom soil. And you can see that both of them, f uh, both in the soil, you get formation of lateral roots, but in the air gap, uh, you hardly see um, any lateral roots forming. And we have sort of like even more continuous data from um, laser ablation tomography, which really shows that the very, very few um, lateral root primordia that are forming there are sort of like, um, sort of like very um, early stage only. So um, in zero branching, it seems that lateral root initiation is inhibited by the absence of water. So uh, how can we further study this? So um, this um, zero branching can be um, also um, reproduced if you're growing um, the roots in an aeroponic system. So this is an aeroponically grown uh, barley root. And if you are actually switching off the misting system, um, you get a region of the root where no um, lateral roots are formed. And because this um, aeroponic system is much more accessible, uh, you can get much more easier to the roots. Um, uh, this was used to look at uh, what is actually happening with those roots. So these roots, uh, which are going, if you're switching off the, the misting system, they're undergoing sort of like a transient water deficit. And if you're then taking the roots and analyzing um, them for various things. The one thing that really quite stood out was that you get an uh, about threefold increase in ABA content. So um, roots under transient water deficit accumulate ABA. Um, 
And you can use uh, treatment with ABA actually um, to mimic uh, this response. So these are, again, uh, aeroponically grown barley roots, uh, but this time around now the misting system hasn't been switched off, but in the root on the right-hand side, um, ABA has been um, added to the uh, misting solution, and again you're getting this zone where lateral root um, formation is inhibited. So how does ABA affect um, the formation of lateral roots? Um, in the uh, talk by Tom Beekman, he already showed that um, for um, lateral root formation, you get this nice formation uh, of uh, an auxin response in the site where a lateral root will form. So, and you can demonstrate this quite nicely using markers like DR5. And in the root here, you can see sort of like that you get these uh, spots of um, increased DR5 activity in the uh, regions where a lateral root is going to form. And if you treat then these roots with ABA, um, you don't get the formation um, of these spots of increased uh, DR5 activity. So that our current thinking about how the branching works is that uh, if the root loses contact with water, you're getting an uh, accumulation of ABA, and you get an increase in ABA signaling, and that this um, inhibits the formation of pre-branch sites, so that roots that are growing through uh, macropore, where they're losing contact with water, um, are no longer forming lateral roots, because that basically will be wasteful. Okay. Um, so, final um, root response I'm going to talk about is hydropatterning. Um, and this is uh, work we've published already a few years back uh, with Jose Dinini, uh, demonstrating that uh, hydropatterning uh, is the branching of lateral roots towards available water. And, what you can see in the maize root, which is growing completely surrounded on all sides um, by soil, is the lateral roots are forming around the whole so circumference um, of the root. But um, if you're letting the root grow down a macropore, um, where it's only on, in contact with soil and water on one side, um, the lateral roots will only form towards uh, the region where there is water. So that's hydropatterning. And basically, if you're growing your Arudopsis um, roots on an agar plate, you're doing a hydropatterning experiment. Um, because um, if you, you're looking at um, this cross-section here, so um, if an Arudopsis root is growing vertically down um, an agar plate, it will be on one side, it will be in contact with the agar. And uh, meniscus of water will form on both sides um, between the root and the agar, and you'll have one side of the root which is exposed to the air. And if you're then tracking the frequency with which um, lateral roots are emerging from this root and the angle at which they're emerging, you can quite easily see in this diagram that the majority of those lateral roots will emerge on the side where the root has contact with the agar. And then there's only very few which are emerging um, on the air side of the root. So, how is hydropatterning regulated? Um, you probably have seen this diagram um, if you're looking at uh, auxin lateral root development a few times already. Um, an auxin is basically involved in all steps uh, of lateral root development, right from the priming and the basal meristem all the way through to lateral root emergence. And a few years back, um, we uh, developed a gene, natura, gene regulatory network um, together with uh, Laurent Laplace. And we could show in this uh, network that the transcription factor R7 is a key node um, 
responsible for controlling uh, lateral route development. So um, it was, in a way, sort of like quite uh, sort of like one of the first ports of call to look at how hydro patterning is affected um, in R7. And uh, so just to be complete, we checked a lot of other um, R7 mutant alleles. Um, but what you can see here, and I'm uh, just briefly explaining what you're seeing here, actually. So in blue is always shown the percentage of emerged lateral routes which are in contact with the agar, and the white part of the column are, is the percentage of routes which are emerging towards the air side. So you see in Colombia, you get about 70 to 80 percent of the lateral routes are emerging uh, on the contact side, um, but in R7, but not in any of the other R mutants tested, um, this uh, hydropatterning response is disturbed. So R7 puts a lot more uh, of their roots towards the air side, so that they can't really distinguish between where the air and the contact side is and where that root should go. Now, um, how could this process be further controlled? And the network showed that one of the downstream components regulated by R7 is a transcription factor called LBD16. And if you're looking at the hydropatterning uh, phenotype of LBD16 mutants, you can see that they're actually phenocopying R7. So they're showing the same defect of putting more lateral roots towards the air side um, of the... Uh, of the route. So R7 is likely to control hydropatterning in an LBD16 dependent manner. Um, and we then really wanted to see if a route is undergoing hydropatterning, do we see actually any difference in LBD16 expression? So LBD16, uh, so that's a GIF, uh, sort of like a functional uh, fusion to the LBD16 protein uh, of GFP, you can see the expression starts somewhere in the elongation zone, so uh, in the silent pole uh, paracycle cells. And if you're um, then having a look at where uh, this LBD16 expression starts and how this is dependent on R7, um, and we did that using a light sheet, so we had a look at uh, where LBD16 expression starts on the contact versus the air side in wild type and in the R7 mutant. And you can see that in the wild type, we are actually getting an asymmetry. So on the contact side, LBD16 expression starts a lot earlier than on the air side. Um, and that this asymmetry is lost in the R7 mutant. So R7 is, is required for driving this asymmetry um, of LBD16 expression and may be the, the reason why we're getting this differential um, placement of lateral roots. Um, now, how does um, R7 achieve that? And if we're looking at the expression of R7 itself, um, this is again sort of like uh, divided up into the contact and the air side of the root, you can't actually really see a difference. So R7 is expressed throughout the root, um, and you can't really see any difference uh, at the, the, the protein level. So that's already given you a hint that uh, it's not the transcriptional regulation of R7 that is important. And we've got uh, further evidence for that. Um, by uh, doing a complementation experiment where we're complementing the R7 mutant with uh, R7 under the control of the 35S promoter, and that is able to rescue the hydropatterning response. So um, it seems it's not transcriptional regulation of R7 that is important for the hydropatterning response, but it must be sort of like a post-translation mechanism that is important here. Now, the question is, which one? And we sort of like got lucky 
uh, when we were sort of like testing various mutants to come across um, OTS1, uh, OTS2 double mutant, um, which also phenocopies the hydropatterning phenotype of R7. So again, we're having more um, lateral roots placed on the air side of the root. Um, so what is um, the, what are the OTS uh, proteins doing? So they are sumoproteases, and I'm um, just going to briefly explain uh, a little bit about sumo. Uh, so sumo stands for small ubiquitin-like um, modifier, and like ubiquitin, it can be covalently attached to uh, proteins through a lysine residue, and unlike ubiquitin, um, it doesn't lead to changes in the protein abundance, but rather than that, it allows the new protein-protein interaction through um, sumo interaction motifs. And what those OTS proteases are doing, they're responsible for cleaving uh, sumo, which has been attached to any kind of protein, off this protein again. So, first of all, we wanted to see whether um, R7 can actually be sumulated. And if you're looking at the protein sequence of R7, there are actually four lysine residues, residues which are potential sumulation sites. And with using pull down experiments, we could show that uh, the wild type um, version of R7 gets indeed simulated. Um, but if you mutate um, all of those four lysine residues to arginine, you're losing um, the ability to simulate um, R7. Now, um, what uh, happens if you put uh, a non-simulatable version of uh, R7 back into the R7 mutant? Um, on the one hand, uh, quite nicely, it restores the lateral root density um, phenotype of the R7 mutant. So this is the mutant complemented with the version of um, R7 where all four um, sumocytes have been mutagenized, and um, still the protein is quite active and working, um, and that's nice to show that we by changing those four residues, we simply haven't killed protein activity. So R7 is still working in that 4KR version, um, but it's unable to rescue um, hydropatterning. So uh, these are data from three independent lines, and they still have the same R7 hydropatterning defect. So you really need simulation of R7 for um, hydropatterning. And that brings uh, me to the sort of like the slide summi summing up our current understanding of hydropatterning. So on the wet side, um, R7 is driving uh, the development um, of lateral roots. Um, but on the side which is exposed to the air, you're getting um, simulation of R7, um, which is inhibiting uh, lateral root formation. Um, and we also have some data. I haven't uh, put it in here because it would have needed a lot more <laughs> longer explanations. Um, we also have some data which shows that the simulation of R7 actually allows the interaction with IA3. Um, and this might be uh, the reason why R7 uh, activity is inhibited on the S side. So, um, I've shown you um, three responses of roots to um, differential water availability. Um, so, hydropatterning where lateral root initiate and emerge preferentially on the side of the root which is in contact with water. Um, and I've just shown you that this is regulated by simulation of R7. Um, I've talked about zero branching where lateral root initiation is inhib inhibited by the absence of water. And ABA um, plays a role in um, inhibiting the auxin maxima that are normally formed at uh, lateral root pre-branch sites. And I've also talked about hydrotropism, 
where roots grow towards a region with high water potential and ABA signaling in the cortex in the elongation zone is important. So I have a very busy acknowledgement slide. Um, so this is all uh, work done in Malcolm Bennett's lab at the University of Nottingham. And um, the hydropatterning story um, has been done in collaboration with Iris Sandanandam at the University of Durham. Um, zero branching um, was in collaboration with Tom Wiegmann and Xavier Dry. And for the hydrotropism story, we worked together with uh, Hideyuki Takahashi uh, in Japan. And I would also like to acknowledge funding we got from ESC, BBSSC, Levium, and the Royal Society. And before um, I stop, I would like to uh, point you back to something which has been mentioned at the very first day of the conference, uh, which is the Hidden Half website uh, at the University of Nottingham. You may remember seeing this in a 3D printed form, being handed to Hans Lambers. So the Hidden Half website has lots of uh, 3D X-ray images of different uh, root systems from a whole range of plant species. So we have anything from Norway spruce. We have date palm, which is very interesting. Um, some of the data, some of the images are actually time course um, experiments. And what we also have on the website is actually cross-sections uh, of different routes. So if you haven't already done so, I would encourage you to have a look at the website. You can also find us on Twitter and YouTube. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>